reading from John 16. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Before I introduce the speaker, I would like to share some thoughts that I had uh, about the heart. You know, we uh, Mandy was invited months ago, and since then I've been excited waiting to hear her speak to us. Um, many of our body parts are required for life. We can do without some of them, but none is more important than the heart. It is so uh, we give our heart a, a large role also in human emotions. It is so important that we use it a great deal in idioms and metaphors. For instance, someone who's kind, we we'll say, has a big heart. To bear one's heart means to share your feelings or thoughts. To learn something by heart is to learn it by memory. To follow your heart is to do what you love rather than what is expected. Someone with a heavy heart is feeling sad. You do something out of the goodness of your heart because of generosity. You, we may pour our heart out to others, or we may put our heart into something. And there are dozens more. If you go online, you can find them just like I did. Uh, but we use the heart all the time. If you think with your head, a heart is just an organ that pumps blood. But if you think with your heart, you know that a heart is the core of human existence. A heart feels, emotes, and expresses. If you ever need something to be grateful for, just check your pulse. And Judy, you may start recording now. And this is actually my favorite part of the service, where we have a speaker who always says something that gets to my heart. Mandy Nathan received a heart transplant at Houston Methodist Hospital in 2019, despite having high antibody levels that prevented her from accepting almost any heart, she received an against the art odds transplant after being an inpatient for six months. Mandy grew up right here in Galveston before attending college and law school and settling in Bel Air, Texas. She is married to David Nathan a native Galvestonian, and has two sons, Zach and Max, and she has quite a family with her here today. So I give to you Mandy Nathan. Thank you, Margaret, and good morning to all of you. All right, thank you. So happy to be with you all here in Galveston this morning, sharing my transplant story as part of your church's Celebrating Blessings series this month, because I have quite a blessing to celebrate, and it's one that a lot of people in Galveston here were praying for along with me. I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself, and then I'll talk about my journey to a heart transplant. As Margaret said, I grew up here in Galveston. I graduated from Ball High School, as did my husband, David. You've met both of our parents. My husband is actually out of town today, so he's the one person who isn't here. After I graduated from Ball High, we both went to Rice, and then I went to Harvard Law School. David and I got married while I was in law school, and after I graduated, we moved back to Houston and then to Bel Air. I worked for the next 27 years, mostly part-time, at a commercial litigation firm named Gibden Bruns, while David taught at Lamar High School and St. John's School. During those 27 years, David and I had our two sons, Zach and Max. Zach is now 25 and is an auditor at Deloitte, and Max is 23 and is a graduate student at the University of Texas. During those years, among other things, I attended St. Luke's Methodist Church in Houston, I did the whole PTO, youth sports, Sunday school, and youth group thing. I served as the mayor pro tem and a council member in Bel Air, as well as on several city boards and commissions, and I served on the board and a couple committees of the Christian Community Service Center. 
all of which pretty much gives you my life in a nutshell up until 2019. With that introduction out of the way, let's go back in time again, and I'll tell you how I ended up at Methodist Hospital and on the transplant list. Growing up, I had no health problems at all. My first hint of a heart problem came when I was 22 and was diagnosed with supraventricular tachycardia, SVT. SVT is just basically a rapid heartbeat. They're not usually dangerous. I didn't feel it, and I wasn't told I needed to do anything for it. I just lived my life and didn't really think about it, though I did start seeing a cardiologist while I was pregnant and continued with annual visits. In 2006, though, my cardiologist told me I had developed atrial fibrillation, AFib, which is a type of SVT, but it's more dangerous because the heartbeats are not only fast but irregular, which means that blood can pool in the heart and cause clots that can go to the brain and cause strokes or TIAs, also known as mini strokes. He prescribed me a blood thinner. AFib isn't very uncommon, but I was very young for it, so it did worry me a bit. Things were fine, though, until 2013. I woke up one night and couldn't feel my right arm or my right leg. I wrestled with it briefly before just going back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I could feel my arms and legs just fine, but I could tell mentally something was not right. My new neurologist com confirmed with a CT that I had had a TIA. I was put on one of the new generation blood thinners to hopefully prevent more. This worried me. But life went on until December of 2014, when I started experiencing new symptoms. I was easily exhausted and short of breath. I was coughing horribly during the day and having to sleep sitting up in a chair. And I was having trouble swallowing. I had developed heart failure. My cardiologist put me on an assortment of heart failure medications and sent me to an electrophysiologist who inserted an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, or ICD, in my chest. An ICD is a flip phone sized device that's connected to my heart with a couple wires and acted as both a pacemaker and an internal defibrillator that could shock me out of potentially fatal ventricular tachycardias. About five weeks later, I had a couple more TIAs a few weeks apart. These were concerning because I'd been told each TIA increased my risk of having a real stroke. My doctors concluded these TIAs were probably from clots that had formed while I was having my ICD implanted. And although I continued to worry, for a while everything seemed okay again. No signs of TIAs and no shocks from my ICD. Through all this time, as I mentioned, I was living my life to the fullest. Very few people knew I had any heart problems at all, and my primary care doctor marveled at how well I was dealing mentally with all of them. But in the fall of 2018, things started falling apart. I had another mini stroke, which earned me another hospital stay. And even worse, my heart failure symptoms were back with a vengeance. I vividly remember telling my electrophysiologist, I feel like I'm dying. He got me in with a heart failure specialist who ordered some advanced genetic testing that revealed in December that I had a very uncommon genetic heart defect that can cause both arrhythmias and heart failures. This despite the fact that no one on either side of my family had ever had any heart problems. He also mentioned for the first time the possibility that I might need a transplant one day. By this time, I was very concerned. But again, I continued living my life. What other choice did I have? I went to work, went to church, did my volunteering, and did things with family and friends. I put it on a good face while Zach and Max were home over Christmas break. <coughs> Then in February of 2019, the wheels started coming completely off. In February and March, I had two episodes of ventricular tachycardia that caused me to get shocked by my ICD twice each time. Not, not a fun experience. Both times I was conscious for one of the shocks and unconscious for the other. With ventricular tachycardia, the heart beats so fast it doesn't have time to fill back up completely before it contracts again, which results in lack of sufficient oxygen to the body and can cause rapid palpitations, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and even cardiac arrest. My doctors put me on two last resort antiarrhythmic drugs and warned me that once VTAC start, they don't usually stop. They also told me it was time to try to get on the national transplant list at nearby Methodist Hospital as soon as possible, albeit at a low priority level. 
By this time, I could no longer drive, and it wasn't safe for me to rock around the block by myself. I was worried even about being at home alone. Mid-March was the last time I went to work, and I bowed out of my volunteering activities. In April, I was back in the hospital again, this time for internal bleeding caused by my blood thinners. This time, I was, by this time, I was a shell of my former self. I was depressed and felt like I was just waiting for the inevitable event that would leave me disabled or dead. I knew I needed a transplant, and I wanted one yesterday. My first step in getting on the list was a visit to the Methodist Hospital Transplant Center. At my initial visit, my new Methodist team informed me that I had stage four heart failure, end stage, and that most stage four patients have a lifespan of a little over a year. That was news to me. They agreed to evaluate me to be placed on the transplant list at Methodist and to begin my evaluation immediately. This evaluation, performed in early May over two weeks as an inpatient, because another long run of VTAC immediately after my first procedure earned me that right. It included a right heart catheterization and a heart biopsy, a stress test, chest and head CTs, an ECG and EKG, carotid, pelvic, and renal ultrasounds, a mammogram and pap smear, chest and mouth x-rays, a colonoscopy, over 100 blood draws, and consultations with every specialty under the sun. Getting approved for the heart transplant list is no easy feat. There are usually only about 4,000 people on the list for a heart at any given time. When all my procedures were done, my team told me the Methodist Transplant Board would probably vote to list me, but as a level four. Usually heart transplants need to be a level two to get heart offers, and that I was going to be discharged. This was frustrating because I felt like I was constantly on the verge of a full bone stroke or a VTAC that my ICD could not shock me out of. I wasn't sure I had time to wait. Even more devastating, on the eve of my discharge, the results of my anti-HLA blood tests came back and brought bad news. The relationship between anti-HLA antibodies and transplants is very complicated, so I'll just summarize by saying that most people don't have any anti-HLA antibodies, but I had lots and that high numbers of them can cause people to reject transplants or worse, to keep patients from even getting on the list. For my anti-HLA antibody test results, my team estimated at that time that my antibodies would cause me to reject between 95 to 98 percent of donated hearts. Subsequent tests <clears throat> showed the percentage was over 99 percent. I knew this percentage, when multiplied by limitations based on heart size, blood type, and geographic region, meant it would be extremely difficult to find a match for me. My team assured me they had protocols to try to get my antibodies down if they did list me, but I was devastated. And so I was sent home in mid-May. Six days later, I had another VTAC, got shocked by my ICD again, and was back at Methodist, this time for good. My extremely high antibody levels gave Methodists considerable pause about lifting me. They even suggested I consider trying to get listed at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles instead because Cedar sinai specializes in patients with high antibodies. I told them I wanted to stay at Methodist, and after input from its immunology board, Methodist agreed to list me. And so, beginning in late May, I spent the next four weeks undergoing Methodist desensitization protocol, as transplant centers refer to the sets of procedures used to try to get antibodies down. The first component was five plasmapheresis treatments, which are basically like dialysis, except that what is removed from the body is the plasma portion of the blood, which is where the antibodies are located. Unfortunately, each of these treatments made me increasingly nauseous with visible results. The second component was four rounds of intravenous immunoglobulin, or IBIG treatments, which are IVs that give patients immunoglobulin that contains good antibodies that have been separated out from donated plasma. The third component was an IV of a monoclonal antibody therapy. Also during the first few weeks I was at Methodist, my team was determining whether my heart had deteriorated enough to warrant the utilization of an intraaortic balloon pump. 
This pump consists of a long balloon that's inserted in the aorta that is inflated through a catheter by a three and a half foot machine that looks like R2-D2's cousin. It helps the pump blood, heart pump blood out and, and oxygen out more efficiently. I desperately wanted that pump because with it came a bump up to level two, the level that could potentially get me heart offers if only we could get my antibody levels down. These were three pretty tough weeks. There were the usual hospital issues, the blood draws, the IV sticks, the vitals checks all night long, the usual hospital room light and noise, the bad food, and the nausea from my treatments. But more than that, the uncertainty over whether any of these treatments would work, over how long I would be there, and how in the world I was possibly going to be able to take things one day at a time as I knew I needed to do. During the months I was at Methodist, I had daily visitors to help lift my spirits, David, Zach, and Max, my parents and David's parents, and close friends. We talked, laughed, prayed, played games, and watched the Astros on their 2019 World Series run. I also had daily visitors from my church's hospital visitation team and the Methodist hospital chaplains who came to talk and pray with me. I was doing a lot of praying and constantly reciting to myself Matthew 6:34, do not worry about tomorrow, tomorrow brings worries of its own, today's trouble is enough for today. Ultimately, I was approved for the balloon pump, which was great news. I would now be at level two. But the slightly less good news was that two days after they put the balloon in on the left side of my chest over my heart, they had to remove it because it was causing a hematoma and nerve damage in my arm. They were able to replant it on the other side of my chest a week later. But in pretty short order, I had to have two more surgeries complete with anesthesia and intubation to further excavate my stubborn hematoma. Once I had the balloon pump, I was moved to the cardiac ICU. Once there, for the next five plus months, I couldn't leave the CICU except to go to the cath lab or the operating room. Couldn't move more than six feet from my pump. Couldn't take a shower. There aren't any showers or bathtubs on the CICU. And I had to listen to the constant chugging and periodic loud shrieking alarms emanating from my pump. I also had to roll with the punches. Among other things, my balloons ruptured and had to be replaced twice, which wasn't uncommon or unexpected, but because was mine was on the wrong side of my chest, I had to be anesthetized and intubated for both again. I had liver and kidney failure scares, raising the prospect of potentially needing a multi-organ transplant, and I was constantly gaining and losing immense amounts of fluid. All this had me concerned about how long my heart would last, even with the help of my balloon pump. Even more devastating, by the middle of June, my first protocol had failed to reduce my antibody levels. After discussing whether my body could tolerate a more aggressive protocol and deciding it could not, my team decided to repeat the entire FOS protocol beginning in early July. This time, each procedure <clears throat> became more grueling, especially the plasmapheresis treatments. By early August, after two and a half months at Methodist, that second protocol had proven unsuccessfully as, un, unsuccessful as well. My antibody numbers had now increased to over 99%. During these months, I was being offered hearts that my team was having to decline because my antibodies would have caused me to reject them. While I managed to keep a pre is it a pretty positive outlook, all things considered? After each of these failed protocols, I had to have very difficult and tearful conversations with my family and friends. I also had intense and tearful discussions about prayer, gratefulness, grief, heaven, and God's plan with a prayer team from St. Luke's Methodist and my favorite hospital chaplain. My faith remains strong through all of this with their help. Still, while I was praying for a new heart, I had to be realistic. With each failed protocol, I knew my chances of finding a matching heart were slipping away. By this time, I had written my celebration of life service, outlined the facts for my obituary, and written letters for David, Zach, Max, and my parents to open upon my death. 
not giving up on me. Don't cry, you're going to make me cry. Not giving up on me. My transplant team combed the research for anything else they could do to try to bring my antibodies down. Eventually, they settled on a third or shorter round of my usual protocol, followed this time by an experimental trial of eight weekly doses of a relatively new multiple myeloma chemotherapy drug that had been successfully used on exactly one heart transplant patient in France. That was, they told me, the last arrow in their quiver. I didn't ask what would happen if it didn't work. We began the eight weekly experimental chemotherapy doses in early September, three and a half months into my stay at Methodist. I didn't have any major problems with them, fortunately, other than that they were accompanied by very high doses of steroids that cut me up half the night and eventually made me osteoporotic. In early October, halfway through the protocol, I got an update on my antibody levels. Devastatingly, they were still stubbornly stuck at over 99%. I had another round of difficult conversations with my family and friends, and a lot more prayer and conversations with my favorite hospital chaplain. For the next four weeks, I put on a good face for family and friends, and I still hoped and prayed fervently every night, but I had largely accepted by this point that my chances at getting a heart were extremely slim. I wondered how long Methodist would let me stay to wait for a long-shot heart, how long my insurance company would pay for it, and whether I'd be willing to take an incompatible heart if my team eventually recommended I accept one and risk rejecting it. On November 9th, I completed the second half of my experimental protocol. That same night, as I lay awake shortly before midnight, almost six months after I entered Methodist, my nurse came in and handed me a cell phone. Incredibly, it was one of my team telling me they had found a heart for which my antibodies were a complete and perfect match. I was told the donor was a young woman from another state. The next 10 hours were a flurry of consultations, blood tests, and forms to sign, followed by a long and painful wait while one of the Methodist surgeons flew to the donor's hospital the next morning to lay eyes on the heart to confirm it was in good condition. David and my sons, my parents, and my Methodist chaplain were with me for the wait. At 10 a.m. on the 10th, my nurse popped her head into my room and gave us the thumbs up, literally. Everyone cheered and then cried for our own happiness, but also in grief for the donor and her family. Some days after my transplant, one of my doctors told me that my chance of getting a heart like the one I got that matched my antibodies so perfectly was 5.7 million to one. A month later, on December 13th, 203 days after I was admitted to Methodist Hospital, I was finally discharged, and I have my life back. I have no signs of rejection. David and I celebrated our 31st anniversary this week. I saw Max graduate from Tulane, and Zach marry his high school sweetheart, Emily all things I thought I might not live to see. And I am so very grateful. Grateful to wake up every day, grateful for my family, friends, and people I don't even know or didn't know until this morning who were praying for me and got me through all of this. Grateful for Methodist Hospital for not giving up on me and for my incredible team of doctors and nurses who saved my life several times over. Grateful for my still anonymous donor, my joy at having received this second chance of life is, of course, tempered by the knowledge that it was made possible by the tragic death of a young woman who is still being grieved by her own family. Words are truly inadequate. I've written two letters to her family, and while they haven't written me back yet, I hope one day they will. And finally, so grateful to God for blessing me with this additional time with my family and friends. I hope you'll indulge me for another minute while I tell you about how you can be someone's blessing. Waiting for an organ to become available, well, knowing that whether you get to continue to live or not is completely out of your control, is incredibly scary. 
About 110,000 people are waiting on the national transplant list. Another person is added every 10 minutes, and 20 people die every day because the organs they need are not donated in time. Only 60% of Americans are registered to be donors, and only a tiny percentage of them will die in a way that allows their organs to actually be donated. In 2019, less than 12,000 deceased donors were able to donate their organs, and there were fewer than 3,600 heart transplants. One donor can save eight lives, one cornea donor can restore sight to two people, and one tissue donor can heal the lives of 75. All major re religions support organ donation. You can register even if you're not in perfect health, and no one is too old to register. You can find more information about organ donation at donatelifetexas.org. It'll also come up if you just Google organ donation in Texas. And you can also register on that site or when you renew your driver's license or even on your iPhone's help app, health app. I hope you'll consider it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. God bless you all.